evening, Pare. Shadurachin for Merhedek Aisirego. I'm Arpina Kashian, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Christ as Hope module live sessions. It, it really is our pleasure and honor to have our bishop open our Christ as Hope module learning season. So, Pazanhair, thank you for being with us every step of the way, and we all seek your fatherly guidance. And when we need you, no matter how busy your schedule gets, mm -hmm. you find a way to being there for us, encouraging us and giving us hope. I am thrilled to announce that Vemkar's first official module, Christ as Hope, opens today. It was about a year ago when we launched our pilot experimental module, Christ as Healer. And ever since then, we've gotten positive feedback and constructive insight. And we thank you for helping us to improve our first module. These modules are one component of VEMCAR, the Diocesan Digital Ministry, which provides opportunities for online and in-person worship, education, and service. And VEMCAR itself plays its role in building up the body of Christ in the 21st century. So these topical modules are for the whole diocese to learn together, or pray together, and serve together as we deepen our understanding of a specific topic and experiencing it through the lens of Christianity based on the tradition and teachings of the Armenian church. And in this case, the topic is hope. As we go through the learning season of each module, our goal is to deepen our understanding of the knowledge of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and strengthen our relationship with him. So for each module, the learning season starts the day that the module launches and lasts for a few months. So for Christ as Hope, the learning season starts today and ends in September. So therefore, uh, for the next few months, we will all be learning about Christ as Hope in various ways through different angles, using multimedia resources, all based on the tradition and teachings of the Armenian church, both in cyberspace and in our parishes. We have 20 live sessions lined up, panel discussions, talks, sacred music, Armenian language, Eastern, Western, classical. We will all be exploring all this as we grasp a deeper meaning of hope together. So if you haven't seen our registration page yet, Deacon Eric will be putting the link in the chat. So feel free to register to any of the live sessions you're interested in. We also have curated self-guided uh, studies for children, youth, and adults based on the 40 plus multimedia resources we created and crowdsourced. You're also welcome to explore all these easily using our new resource filter system, um, all on the topic of hope, of course. Uh, you can find all this on the module page of our website. Deacon Eric will share this link in the chat. Thank you, Deacon Eric, um, uh, for you to access. And for those who are new to VEMCAR and to our topical modules, please see the FAQ section at the bottom of the page for more information about that. So this is a diocesan effort, starting from our faithful across the diocese, our clergy diocesan council, our teachers, parish leadership, all the way to our diocesan staff and our bishop. One of the many things that VEMCAR focuses on is providing opportunities for all to take their part in building up the body of Christ. So now I'd like to ask my colleague, Deacon Eric, to go over a few guidelines and to welcome our bishop. Deacon. Thank you, RP. Uh, again, welcome everyone to tonight's live session. Uh, we're very excited to have Bishop Daniel with us. And just, uh, I think we're all veterans by now with Zoom, but if you wanna go ahead and mute yourself if you're not already muted. And tonight's um, format is just going to be a presentation uh, given by Bishop Daniel and then at the end, uh, it will be a few minutes for uh, discussion and we're looking to uh, just go till eight o'clock tonight. So we're not looking to go over that time. So we're gonna try and get everything um, done by then. And that being said, I'd like to invite our primate, our Arach Nort, Bishop Daniel Serpazan Hyde, if you'd um, kindly lead us in a presentation and uh, perhaps open us uh, with a prayer. 
Thank you, uh, RP and Deacon Eric. Why don't, why don't we indeed begin with a prayer? Anun hor, yevor tvo, yevor queen serpo, amen. Good and merciful God, we entreat you with all our hearts and we ask for your compassion. As you promised your servants when you said, whatever you ask of the Father with faith in the name of the Son, it will be given to you. Now grant once again the requests of all of us who have faith in you and do whatever is good for us, answering our prayers as we put all our hope in you. In your abundant mercy, console us in this life and lead us so that we may arrive at the unfathomable kingdom of heaven for the glorification and the honor of the all-holy trinity, now and always, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. It's uh, nice to see all of you. We got a big, huge crowd here for a Zoom meeting, and um, I'm delighted to, to sort of open our, our new learning season here, Christ as hope, Christ our hope, um, Christ is hope, actually, and um, uh, excited about this new season of learning uh, that we are launching tonight uh, with all kinds of resources and materials for family use, for individual use, for parish use. Those I know are aware of it. And um, so... Come, coming to you with love and with prayers uh, for, for, a, for, a, for a, an uplifting evening this evening, really a hope, hope-filled evening this evening and for the duration of our, of our learning season together. Um, what I'd like to do is start with a psalm. Um, Psalms, I think we overlook sometimes of how powerful they are and how precious they've been um, in the history of Christianity and the lives of Christians from the very, very beginning, beginning with the lips of Jesus himself who was constantly praying the Psalms. And um, so I'd like to begin with, with a particular Psalm, which is resonates really with hope. And, um, and I've, I've chosen this Psalm um, because it's found in the new prayer rule, um, um, which, uh, which is launched for this uh, Christ as Hope module. And you can find that um, on the Vemcar app. And I'm sure uh, Deacon Eric will point it out to you as well. I'm going to um, right now just share my screen with you. Uh, and, and what I'd like to do is it's hard for us to do this together, unfortunately, um, because of the nature of Zoom. So, what I'm going to ask you to do is read along quietly, pray along uh, this psalm. I'm going to read the lines and the verses of the psalm from beginning to end. Try to read it a little bit meditatively, contemplatively, and um, please do read along um, with me. Yete ganachendrek hayrinov hedevil yev agotel asiga in sunerort salmosne. Yete subkirke tserkovne garnak in in sunerort salmos apanal vor panagial ne hokdutun partsreluin aydov gskesi yete ganachendrek tuka hayrinov den gehede. But, uh, but I'm going to be praying um, in English, and uh, please follow along. The one who dwells in the aid of the Most High rests in the shadow of God in heaven. He will say to the Lord, you welcome me, and I hope in you, God, my refuge. He will save me from the hunter's trap and from hostile words. My coffee he will keep you on his back. He will find hope in the protection of his arms. Like armor encasing you, so is his truth. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Things that roam around in the dark, the demonic scandal at midday. Thousands will fall at your side, tens of thousands at your right side. Nothing will come near you. But your eyes can regard and comprehend the recompense for sinners, for you are my hope. You made the Most High your refuge. No evil will come near you, and danger will not come under your roof. He ordered his angels for you to protect you in all your goings. 
he will embrace you in his arms so that you will never strike your foot on the stone. You will walk on vipers and scorpions and your foot will step on lions and dragons. For he placed his hope in me and I will save him. I became his refuge because he knew my name. He will call for me and I will hear him and I will be with him in affliction. I will save him and glorify him. For many days I will fill him and show him my salvation. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and always and unto the ages of ages, amen. Beautiful Psalm comes to us, um, actually it's a part of our daily prayer in the Armenian church. Uh, those of you that are familiar with the Jamakirk, the book of hours or the songs of the hours, this is the basic prayer book, the book for daily prayer, for every hour of the day, basically. And uh, I know at St. Nerses, our clergy are very well aware. Those of you that have spent some time at our summer conferences at St. Nerses or at St. Barton camp, our, our diocesan summer camps, uh, when we pray in the morning and in the evening, um, those prayers are taken from the Jamakirk. And in the Armenian tradition, this Psalm 90, 91 um, is, is, is part of the evening prayer every evening. So I'm gonna go back to that Psalm um, in just a second. I, I hope the idea of hope resonated with you. You saw the hope that comes about through that Psalm. And as I said, we're gonna come back to it in a second. I wanna share with you um, an experience I had um, just on Sunday, July 4th. Uh, I was home with my family. And um, like many of you, I hope, uh, were together with friends and family for, for Fourth of July and hot dogs, hamburgers, and fireworks, and, and all of that. People we know, friends, people we don't know, uh, were gathered together in, in, in the home, a uh, lakeside home by some friends of, of mine for many, many years. And, um, um, and within 20 minutes, two people came up to me. Um, one person who's very close to me came up to me and said, um, I need to speak with you. I said, well, of course, what's going on? Now, I'm not dressed like this. I'm dressed in shorts and a t-shirt. It's the 4th of July. And um, long story, basically uh, a relative, a family uh, member who had had some health uh, issues, a um, uh, gentleman in his 50s, uh, was on the road to recovery, was about to be released from the hospital. Everything was looking good. And in the middle of the night, um, went into cardiac arrest and was intubated and was now in a coma. Um, you know, so obviously a lot of emotion, um, you know, the, the shock of, of such a thing. Um, and, and what do you do? And what do you say? Um, so we talked and I listened mostly and we prayed and, um, you know, what do you do? You, you put one foot in front of the other. We pray, we open ourselves up to the Lord. We, we rely on our faith. We turn back to our faith. We turn our attention uh, beyond just, you know, the medical reports, what the doctor said, what the diagnosis is, the information we have, the information we don't have. We tried to take a step back from all of that and look at a horrific, frightening, awful, scary situation, inviting God into that situation. And so we prayed for a few minutes together. Did prayer take away all the pain? No. Did it take away all the fear? No. But it brought us together. And it invited Jesus into this horrible situation. Not 10 minutes later, uh, another couple comes up to me. I was, you know, about to step outside and go on the patio with everyone else. Um, can we talk? Sure, we can talk. And these folks are not even Armenian. They said, we just um, heard about our three-year-old grandchild, our beautiful granddaughter. Um, her name is Chloe. Um, you don't know her, she's not Armenian. Um, she's had some developmental struggles, you know, in the first few years of her life. And we just got a word from some genetic testing that she has a rare form of mu muscular dystrophy. Um, not even just muscular dystrophy, a rare form of muscular dystrophy. And the doctors are saying, the neurologists are saying, we don't know much about this, but um, the timeline is basically this. Um, she's gonna struggle, her muscles are gonna weaken, um, we don't know how long she'll live, but she'll end up within a certain number of years on a ventilator. Um, she'll be in a wheelchair. She won't have much control of her body. And most people don't live beyond the age of about 20. 
<laughs> so, and I'm being selfish now, okay? I'm being selfish. I'm a priest. I signed up for this. But um, wow, you know, one disaster onto the next disaster. And, you know, people come to me. Why do they come to me? In one case, because they're basically family. In another case, maybe because they know I'm a priest, a bishop. Um, um, and that's besides the point. But they came up to me. And what are they looking for? They're looking for hope. I'm not a doctor. I, I can't intervene in what the diagnosis is. We could have talked about what the doctor said. I could have said, well, you know, um, it's new. It's a new disease. We don't know. And, you know, look, you know, a year ago, everybody was desperate. People were dying. And now there's a vaccine and, and people are safe and, and, and things are looking good. Who knows? Maybe there'll be, you know, there's hope. There's hope, right? I don't think that's the hope that they were looking for from me. So what did I do? I listened. Um, I, I, I choked back tears. I, I acknowledged, you know, fear. Um, they didn't choke back tears. The tears filled their faces. I listened and we prayed. We held hands and we prayed and we invited God into this situation. Um, they were not looking for, you know, for trite, you know, they didn't want me to lecture them. This was not the time to pull up, you know, uh, some passage uh, from the Gospels. I could have done that. Maybe that would have brought some comfort. I don't know. Sometimes it does. But this was not the time for, for Bishop Daniel to give his sermon. Um, that's not what they needed. What they needed was real life-giving hope, right? And, you know, that's the theme of this learning module. What is that life-giving hope? We can talk and, and maybe we will. And I know you've got another bunch of other live uh, sessions coming up. You're going to have some clergy and some other very wise and good faithful people speaking with you and to you. Um, and I think one of the things we have to set out early on is what, how have we abused the word hope, right? I think we've abused that word. I think the world around us talks about hope, which is not really a life-giving hope. It's not the hope that Jesus speaks about, right? The name of this module is Christ as hope. Christ is our hope. There's a lot of people out there that talk about hope in the situations like the ones I experienced this weekend in 20 minutes. Um, and that's not what people are looking for. And it's not the hope that we believe in, right? So I think one of the things that we want to do is to be thinking about that. We want to distinguish between this kind of hope that we throw around, right? Um, um, the doctors will say, well, we don't lose our hope. There's always a chance for a miracle. Okay, that is a kind of a hope. Is that the hope that Jesus gives to us? Or is there something even greater than that? Well, there's always the hope for a miracle. Okay, and miracles happen, and they happen every day, and I've seen them, and many of you have too. And, and, and that, that is a kind of a hope. But is there a hope that resides beyond supernatural events, beyond, you know, diagnoses, if we're talking about sicknesses, which is what battered me this weekend? Um, is there a hope that is beyond even that kind of a medical miracle? And our answer as, as children of the Armenian church, as children of God, as, as you know, disciples of Jesus would be absolutely yes. And that's what Jesus wants to give us. That's the hope that he wants us all to seize, right? And I, and I hope that we can explore that together in the coming months in this module. Um, so now what I'd like to do is I, I'm gonna share my screen again. I wanna go back to that same Psalm and I wanna look at some of the verses of that Psalm together. So the Psalms, right? are not Christian writings, strictly speaking. The Psalms were written a thousand years before Jesus. And yet, there are words that came out of Jesus' own mouth. There are words that St. Paul quotes constantly. There are words that the prophets are quoting. There are words that, you know, we find all over the, bottom of the Bible from beginning to end. They're literally the language that our church fathers speak. Right? So there is something very um, mystical, there is something very powerful and very Christian about the Psalms. Um, that's a topic for another day that some of you have heard me speak about, and it always inspires me. And it's the reason why I wanted to begin and make really our starting point for this module, this learning module, Christ as Hope, 
not from the words of Jesus per se, but from long, historically long before Jesus. And perhaps in words that um, the prophet David, the psalmist David, King David, who, to whom we attribute the words of most of the Psalms anyway, um, you know, perhaps Jesus inspired him in the composition and in the writing and in the singing of these Psalms. So let's go back um, to that, um, to, to that Psalm 90, 91. Let's look at some of these words again. The one who dwells in the aid of the Most High rests in the shadow of God in heaven. The one who dwells in the help, in the assistance, in the support of the Most High. God is the Most High. So when you and I, we are the ones, that when, when we make the decision to make our home there in God's help, when we do that, which is, of course, our choice, no one can force us to do that. Then we find ourselves resting in the very presence of God in heaven. We could spend the remainder of this time just talking about that line. If we are looking for God's support, for God's hope, for God's healing, for God's faith and strength that comes from God, when we want to be godly people, we must make the decision day by day, sometimes minute by minute, to live to make our home with God. Right? That's a decision. It's a conscious decision that we make to dwell in the aid, uh, looking for help from God. That's to make our home there. Then we find ourselves in the presence of God, in the shadow of God. God becomes that light source, and we live right there in his shadow, right there next to him. The person that does that will say to the Lord, you welcome me, and I hope in you, God, my refuge. You welcome me, God, and I will place my hope in you. Hope is not a desperation, right? Hope is not an act of desperation. Hope is an attitude of life. It's a conscious decision that we renew and remind ourselves of day after day after day, right? In the morning, we wake up and we say, God, today I will place my hope in you. You are my sanctuary. I will make the decision to find you and to make you my refuge, my, my shelter, right? He, God, will save me from the hunter's trap and from hostile words. And now we have to kind of get into the imagery of a world that's very different from our world. When I am looking for dinner, I don't have to go out and trap it, right? I don't have to go and lay a trap for some some animal to, to get caught in so that I can take that animal home and skin it and eat it. Maybe some of you are hunters. I'm not. Never have been, never will be. But uh, our way of, of, of getting a steak or a hamburger or a chicken dinner is a whole lot more sophisticated and technological. But the reality remains, right? Um, this particular trap is the hunter that's out looking for me, not for, not for a cow or a, or a pig or a lamb, but is looking for me. God, my hope, will save me from the trap that is laid in a sinister way by someone that's out there to get me, right? An evil hunter. Uh, call that hunter Satan. Call that hunter evil. Call that hunter a messed up world. Uh, call it whatever you wish. We know very well, and we often are under the impression and we sense that there is no good out there. There is a force of evil that is working against what I'm trying to do to find hope in this world, in a very difficult world that we're living in. We all felt that last year uh, during the pandemic. He, God, will lift you on his back. He will lift you on his back. You will find hope in the protection of his arms. The subject here, once again, is the one who dwells in the, in the aid, in the support, in the arms of the Most High, the one who makes that decision. He will lift you on his back, and you will find hope in the protection of his arms. Uh, some of you are parents. Many of you are parents and grandparents. Uh, all of us were children, and all of us can remember uh, in, our, in our mind's eye the feeling of being held by the one that protected us, our parent, our father, our mother, the one that loves us. Even today, maybe last year, in a time of desperation, 
someone out there took us into his arms or her arms and just held us. Some of us had losses last year. Some of us lost loved ones last year. And, you know, in the irony, the, the, the horrible irony of a pandemic, of, of a virus, we weren't able to hold ourselves. And, and maybe we longed for that. That's what God longs to do for us. That's where we find God's hope. Like armor encasing you, so is God's truth. Right? Again, we're not people that, that encase ourselves in armor. That's a military image. Um, even today, you know, the armor that our soldiers uh, in Armenia, in, in the US, uh, cover themselves with look very different from the kind of armor that an Armenian soldier or, or a Jewish soldier, an Isra you know, Israeli soldier from, uh, from 3,000 years ago would have encased himself. But that durable protection is real, tangible, it's hard. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies in the day. Uh, again, military imagery here. The terror of the night in the first case is the terror of not knowing who is about to come and assault you, uh, an army, right? Uh, a lot of our, you know, our, our, our people right, in Armenia, in, our, in Artsakh, just months ago, they felt the terror of the night. They did not know where that next drone strike was going to hit. They went to sleep at night fearing that terror, not knowing where that arrow or that drone or that rocket would fly at night or in the day. That's the imagery here. But obviously for us, it's an analogy for most of us of another kind of terror that, that stalks us at night, right? Not from a, you know, an arrow like a bow and arrow or, or even a rocket or a bullet that flies during the day, but from other pestilence, from other virus, from other evil, right? Other scandals that come out to get us, right? And in each of our lives, um, if we were in a more intimate atmosphere, we might share what that arrow looks like in our lives today. I can tell you that Sunday afternoon, um, that arrow that was sort of assaulting me was the arrow of anguish of people that I care for. Um, in the one case, uh, you know, a man that I know and, and love. In the other case, a, a young little three-year-old girl um, whose, you know, life will be very different from the life that I've had in my life, whose grandparents were sobbing. All of us have our arrows. And it is in, you know, in the face of those arrows that we look for the hope that comes from God, right? The hope that is there for us should we choose to enter it, to take a step into that to, into that hope, right? That hope being not a place on a map, but the arms of our Lord, right? And that comes to us um, not by, you know, an injection or, or a book that we read, but it comes to us when we make first the willingness, the initiative, take that initiative to step into that, to say, Lord, I want to live in your hope. You are my hope. Christ, you are my hope, right? Christ as hope, Christ is hope, right? Um, you will not fear things that roam around in the dark, the demonic scandal at midday. Uh, thousands will fall at your side. Here again, military imagery, the battlefield. Thousands of your comrades will fall at your side, 10,000s at your right side, yet nothing will come near you. Um, um, right? Nothing will come near that person who dwells in God's hope, in the hope of Christ. Even though everything is collapsing around you, we can find that hope. Your eyes can regard and comprehend the recompense, the reconciliation for sinners, for you are my hope. You, God, are my hope. Um, hope is not an emotion. Hope is an attitude, but it's more than an attitude. Hope is a person. Right? Hope is Christ. You are my hope. I don't know if that's a way that, that, that uh, some of us are accustomed to praying. Uh, when you pray in the morning, in the evening, uh, whether those are regular prayers for you, maybe some of you are not accustomed to praying quite so regularly. Um, um, do you know? Are, could, could we could we speak to Jesus and say, "You are my hope. You are my hope, Jesus." 
Um, and simply, again, take the initiative to do that. Sometimes we, we tend to pray in a passive way. We kind of wait for Jesus to slap us in the face and to, right? Um, we wait for something to come to us. Um, our prayer becomes very emotional. We wait for it to, to feel something in our prayer. And sometimes we do, and that's not a bad thing. And so it's a blessing when it, when it occurs, when as a result of our prayer, we can suddenly feel uplifted. We can feel filled with hope or filled with joy or filled, filled with a sense of relief. But I always say it, and uh, it's not just me, but it's really, it's really, uh, the, it's, it's our faith. It's, it's the experience of the faith is that prayer is not always about how we feel. Sometimes we simply have to step into it. We have to step into that relationship of, of, uh, with God. We have to step into the presence of, of God, whether or not we feel something, right? We need to be able to say in our prayers, you are my hope, Jesus. Today, I am making you my hope. And, and why not? Jesus, come and let me feel your hope. Come lift me up. Do that today. Sometimes we're not used to be speaking very forcefully with Jesus, but that's exactly what he wants. And here in this particular line of this psalm, there's, there's a prayer, right? It turns into a prayer that says, you are my hope. Very bold, right? Um, now again, speaking to the person who, who seeks that hope, you made the most high God your refuge, your shelter. No evil will come near you and danger will not come under your roof. Danger will not come into your home. He ordered his angels for you protect you in all your comings and goings, right? That's what God did, right? We read in the whole Bible about all the things that God did. We read about all the miracles that Jesus did. What did God do? He ordered his angels to care for you. You plural, you singular, right? I could, I could name all of your names right now. That's what God did. That's why God is there. That's why God stepped into this world for you, to protect you in all your comings and goings. He will embrace you in his arms so that you never strike your foot on a stone. <laughs> I have to laugh. That last line, anybody that's seen me in the last week or two knows that uh, I had a little accident a couple of weeks ago while I was uh, uh, running. And I, I literally struck my foot on a stone and came crashing down on my ankle. And now I've got a severely sprained ankle to, and a big boot that I have to wear and I'm limping around. Um, but that's the image. It kind of speaks to my, my, my life right now. Um, God will embrace you in his arms and he will protect you so that you will never trip up, right? Not, not in, the, in the trivial way that I did, but, it, but in a more serious way. You won't trip up. God will be there for you always to the extent that we call on him to be our hope. You will walk on vipers and scorpions and your foot will step on lions and dragons, right? A little bit poetic here, um, but again, we're talking about a life 3,000 years ago. Anybody that's lived in Armenia uh, in the summertime in a village, you know that the vipers, the scorpions are out there. Uh, if you visit a village in Armenia, there's scorpions crawling all over the place. And if you step on one, it will sting you and it will hurt. All right. Now, obviously, the hope that we ask for here is not just against the sting, uh, as, as much as that can hurt and, and might put you in the hospital. But it's the other stings, it's the other bullets, it's the other anguish that we face in this life, um, um, in each one of our lives. And, and I, you know, I hope that as, as we read this, this psalm, as we pray it together, um, that, that we, we keep in mind in the forefront and, we, and take a little bit of time to reflect a little bit about what, what are those vipers, those scorpions, those lions and dragons in my life, in the life of my family, in the life of the people that I love. In the life of people that care for me, in the life of my church, my parish, my diocese, my bishop, my priest. Um, uh, that's the hope that we want to enter into with Christ. Not always in our own personal lives, but in the lives of, of our communities. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, and from that, now the tone of the, of, the, of the psalm changes, and now God speaks to us. God says he placed his hope, she placed her hope in me, and I will save him. I will save her. I became his shelter, his refuge, because he knew my name. He knew my name. He called out my name. Jesus, you are my hope. He will call for me, and I will hear him, 
and I will be with him in affliction. I will save him. I will glorify him. For many days, I will fill him and show him my salvation. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and always and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Powerful psalm, right? Um, for some of us, you know, uh, we, we may recall it from some earlier day, a Sunday school day, or, or maybe flipping through the Psalms one day. Some of you maybe know the Psalm very well. Um, great, great, great summer to, to pull up that Psalm and reflect on it and read through it again. Uh, maybe tonight, you know, maybe tonight before you go to bed, maybe in your prayer time in the morning, pull up that Psalm and read it um, and, and take note of the shifting um, subject. Sometimes we're speaking to God. Sometimes God speaks to us, right, directly, like the end of that song. In other places, there's a narrator that's saying the person that steps forward and looks for hope in God, right, that person will dwell in the life of God. Um, and I want to close with, with a thought, one thought, um, that the hope that is real and that's living Right? Not, not, the, not, not the, the desperate hope, the desperation hope, not the hope that is just optimism. Right? Optimism and hope are not the same thing. I mean, in the world we live in, the kind of a secular world, hope is really a little more than optimism. That's not what Christian hope is. That's not what Christian hope is. Christian hope is not just optimism. It's not naive, you know, hoping for a better day. No. Hope is a person. It's Jesus Christ. It's God's very presence. That's the hope that we look for. That's the hope that God is calling us toward. It's the hope that God is calling the Armenian church to discover and embrace, right? And therefore, hope can never exist in isolation. There is no Christian hope for me and me alone. So when we feel like we need hope, right, when all is lost, the three-year-old little girl has her parents and grandparents, you know, in desperation because they realize now that this little girl's life is going to be very different than that of most little three-year-old girls, right? When we reach that moment, you know, a woman discovers that, that you know, her younger brother is, is comatose and, 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 and his life's, life is very uncertain, right? In those moments of desperation, whatever they are for all of us, of hopelessness, when we crave that consolation, that faith, that hope, we cannot do that alone. The best we'll end up with is wishful thinking and optimism. True Christian hope, which is the presence of God in Jesus Christ, only comes about when we gather together, when we come together in communion with one another. And I, I chose that word carefully. When we come together, not just as a community in our parishes, not just as a family, but in communion. When we, as many people, come together as one body in Christ and with Christ. That's what the word communion means. I say it all the time. Communion is not just that little particle on your tongue on Sunday morning. That's the start. Communion comes when we take that as the beginning point of building up the body of Christ, building up our church, building up the community of people who are willing to make their home in Christ, with Christ. That's where hope is born. And I think a lot of Christians and a lot of people looking for God, even looking for Christ, lose, um, um, fall short and become discouraged because they're trying to do it alone on their own terms. And that's the beginning of the end. That's a fatal flaw. It will get no, for, you might feel better the next day. You might pray a passage from the Bible and feel momentarily uplifted. And we should read the Bible. I'm not saying not to do that. And we should pray on our own in the corner of our rooms. Yes. But ultimately, the hope that we seek, Jesus Christ, Christ as our hope, will only, we will only discover that true living, life giving hope when we do so together. That's why Christ as hope is the work of the church. It's not just every individual's work. It's the work of the church. In your home parish, in your family, 
in your circle of loved ones, maybe in your adult education group, in your Bible study group, that's the starting point. And that has to grow, right? I have to be a part of that. Your priest has to be a part of that. Our neighbors have to be a part of that, ultimately. And we build that and we grow. And when we do that, that's why you hear me saying it all the time, when we build up the body of Christ, then we find ourselves in that living hope, right? In the comfort, right, of the Most High, in the consolation, in the joy of the Most High. So that's my prayer for all of you uh, tonight, um, is that we can work together, 122 of us here, that's a pretty strong force, um, even in a diocese that takes up half the United States. 122 people working together to build up the body of Christ, playing, praying for one another, praying with one another, drawing more people in, exploring further the reality and the joy uh, that comes with discovering Christ as our hope, right? Bringing it to our people in our parishes with patience and prayer. Um, then we begin to find that hope. And that hope gives us life through thick, through thin, through good, through bad, through light, through dark, through pandemic, through health, it will always be there because God will always be there for us in Jesus Christ as our living hope.